Hello and welcome to In the Light, Growing Your Soul with me, Anna Isabel. And I am very excited because I am joined once again by the wonderful Caroline Evans. Hello, Caroline. Hello. Nice to see you again. Lovely to see you. Lovely to be here. Thank you. Always, always such a joy to talk to you because um, as regular viewers of this um, channel will know, I get very excited when I'm talking to you. So <laughs> that's because you are a wonderful, wonderful herbalist amongst other other strings to your bow. So you are here because you have a fabulous new book, which is called Discovering the Herbs of Autumn. Oh yeah, here we go. Woo herbs, herbs, and there, they, there it is. Your books are so beautiful. The last one, last time you were here was to talk about the summer one. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to talk about autumn. And I have a little list of things that I want to ask you about because cool. we're recording this almost on the eve of Halloween oh. and so that brings pumpkins to mind and I know that you've got 100%. a section about pumpkins they're in here um, yes. how are pumpkins medicinal ah well I mean pumpkins it's not just the uh the flesh it's also the seed I mean the the pumpkin yeah pumpkin has a lot I mean anything in in nature that is um orange and red has beta carotenes in it okay so that makes it good for the eyes makes it good for the skin they're full of vitamin c as well it's really a long sustaining um vegetable but also as i think i mentioned before as herbalists we like to call anything that's useful a herb so as far as i'm concerned a pumpkin is a herb you know what i mean i'm a herb no but it's like you know but it's it's just that we, we do like to do that because you know it's true it's, it's an amazing herb it's, it's it has a long history with native americans um uh, like they always used to plant it as a um they plant it with the beans and with the corn it had this this triad thing of like basically permaculture it's, it's made us the original way to grow it was permaculture you know one's the vine on the ground the the bean going up and then the the shade of the other so it, it, it's the way it is but um this i digress um but basically the seed is also incredibly useful because it is so full of of zinc now the irony so that so there you have the flesh that's full of vitamin c and the seed that's full of zinc and actually those two work synonymously when you ingest them in the body so i always say to people i mean right now it's funny because we are on the eve of uh, old hallows uh Saiwen or samhain and uh, I've left my kids in the house carving their pumpkins out right now. And they're like, oh, mum, what do we do? So, OK, we've got one for flesh and I've got one for for um, seeds. So they're keeping them separate as they carve their things because they know mum's going to make soup and or, or whatever. I wish that I could make a decent pumpkin pie. I'm trying over the years. Um, I did find a really great recipe recently. And then, of course, uh, we got the seed. We always roast the seeds and get the, the kids to have it. I mean, the seeds you can use. I, I always recommend um, the seeds for men to help with the prostate so it's specifically the nutrient that's needed for the prostate that pumpkins are pumpkin seeds are really good for that so and for inflamed uh, prostate yeah which yeah man male menopause uh, menopause as i was reading about recently that's what it's good for so anyway <laughs> so if we haven't got pumpkins um the pumpkins that we buy uh, the pumpkin seeds that we buy in in the shops would would those be just as good Oh, totally. 100%. Oh, yeah, yeah, 100%. Organic always is the way because, you know, glycophyte and all this stuff that, you know, and GMOs are just not worth, you know, we don't need this kind of like uh, non-natural substance in our body. We don't want our body to work hard to try to recognize it, to then digest it. Your body's working hard enough to, to get what it needs from it. Let's make it easy. So, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's absolutely the same. You know, most of the time I will buy or um, organic and I will buy it throughout the year. You know, pumpkin doesn't grow throughout the year. However, what is amazing about pumpkin is it can sit in your larder in your kitchen for months. So it is a really sustainable vegetable that will last for a long time. You know, it, re it really does. Um, yeah, it keeps going. So, yeah, it's great. It's that, great. So it, I've, I've grown pumpkins in the past. Mm. Like I've got um, I'm. I've got them as decorations in my sitting room at the moment. Ah, nice, oh, good girl, good girl. <laughs> but the, here they will be and, uh, until they are eaten. Um, and that generally happens, starts to happen after Halloween. Yeah. But it's, I, I know that they can last for a long time. So you harvest them and then you've got pumpkins to last you for a few months um, if you store them properly, exactly. preferably not in your sitting room with central heating. 
Um, <laughs> in your outhouse or in your in your you know in in your larder, you know, if everybody have a cellar or a shed, you know, that's that's the best place to keep them. Exactly. Cool. So for those who are for those of us who are lucky enough to have actual pumpkins, yeah. Uh, how what do we do with the seed? How do we okay. once we track them? What do we do with them? Okay, great. Well, the simplest thing to do with the seed is um, you, you extract them and then you can, like, I have a dehydrator that we don't always have, but say, for example, you put on a dehydrator and you literally roast them, you, you dry them that way. But an even easier way, and actually one that even though I have a dehydrator, I will choose over the dehydrator every time, is just the bottom tray of the oven and you just put them on there and, uh, yeah, you literally just roast them, usually about 20 minutes. And then you can just roast them on there. And when the thing with the, the pumpkin, when you because you need them really nice and crispy, because otherwise you're going to have the harder shell to take out the, the other shell. But you can you can eat the whole lot if you if you uh, crisp them up quite nicely. I think probably about 20 minutes is, is, is enough at about 100. And yeah, a low, a low heat. 100 is plenty. Yeah, 100, 100, 120. Yeah, is, is maximum, I would say. Yeah, to, 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 to cook them. And then a lot of people just add salt or kelp flakes. That's lovely. I mean, some people like honey and things like that on them as well, but it depends where your your taste buds are. But I know, like I say, I have a lot of patients who would go for, say, peanuts, like a, a, at a night time, you know, as a snack. And I'm like, well, stay away from the peanut because that's not so beneficial for your liver. Go towards something like a pumpkin seed so you can add salt to it and you're still getting the benefit in that way. You know, there's a whole myth behind salt being dangerous for us anyway. And then there we are being full of salt water. So what can I say? You know, so it's like, mm. But anyway, that, that's, uh, yeah, there's, there's whole avenues that we can go down today, Anna. So let's see where, where the mycelium digresses with us is. <laughs> oh, now you mentioned mycelium and mushrooms were mm. on my list. Ooh, so okay. now this time of year, of course, always makes me think of mushrooms. I never dare pick any because uh, no way do I know yep. what, what is, um, what is, safe and what isn't that's on my list of things to learn i think in the near future but um nevertheless my mind turns to mushrooms and this year they have been bountiful um and so what can you tell us about mushrooms that we we can buy um or for people who do know mushrooms um what what are how are they useful i think is the question I, i'm asking yeah, mushrooms. Yeah, you are absolutely right. This year, they are absolutely abundant. I mean, we just came back from Wales and there on the, on the grass there that has maybe a few mushrooms in the year. It's absolutely packed. It's so busy with different varieties of mushrooms. And I don't know all the varieties. And I'm, I've also been very well conditioned to wary of mushrooms, wary of mushrooms. And I've done many different courses. But I would say that the best thing for um, people to do for themselves is to buy a log that's already had the plugs in it, then you know you're gonna have oyster mushrooms. Like I did that some years ago. I was like, oh, it's not working. And then the year later, it was full of oyster mushrooms. I was like, that's great. Or you can have shiitake or whatever you like. Then you can start to see how you know for sure that's what it looks like and you can see, and then you can put it to, you know, recognize it with nature. Um, mushrooms are, I mean, mushrooms are a saving grace of this planet. They really are. They are the food of the forest. I mean, they are the meat of the forest, even, should I say. They're the food of the forest, but they are the real meat of the forest. I mean, we literally can live on, on mushrooms. They are full of protein. So it's it's a great pr a protein source for vegetarians. For, for everybody, it's it's a, a great protein source. You know, it's, it's fantastic. They've even been discovering uh, mushrooms that in Hiroshima that are able to break up the, the radioactive material amazing and, and more recently and i literally read this just a few days ago is that they found mushrooms that can break down plastic single-use plastic i'm like mushrooms are so smart it's just out of this world so yeah mushrooms you know magic to the mushrooms mushrooms are, are a way that the whole forest communicates with each other as well it's like this whole network that goes underneath the ground and it all you know we have all seen avatar it is exactly like that that's what mushrooms do it's like it's it's communicating with you know sending the information from that oak tree over to the next oak tree in the far forest where the oak tree's roots don't don't go but the mycelium will go there it's unbelievable how this network works it's 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 really it's just this whole language under the ground that we have no idea it's it's just happening and and we're just oblivious to it most of the time so mushrooms i i think need deep respect really they do need deep respect because they are yeah they, they are our saving grace they they really can they they can sort this planet out if we just like hopped off for a couple of 
couple of years, we'd come back and mushrooms would have fixed it, right? All the plastic gone, all, all that extra, but they, they're still doing it regardless of, of what, you know, us being here. But I think we need to respect them, which is also when you pick them to not yank them up, you know, to cut them so that you leave the spores, you know, give them a shake when you pick them so that, so the spores come out and then you can, then there'll be more the next year, you know, this is the way it is. You know, so and, and they're, they've got a long mythology and association with the fairy folk. So, you know, it's always this that between the worlds, which, of course, we're at this time of year anyway, where it's between the worlds. And, uh, you know, the veil is thin right now, but the fairy folk are, 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 you know, all of this stuff is going on without us knowing about it, you know. So it's, you know, it, it's quite amazing. And, and these days, even more with mushrooms, I know a lot of people these days um, are microdosing on mushrooms, like uh, they're microdosing on um, magic mushrooms. And that is having an uh, effect on depression. It's it's amazing, like herb for uh, again, it does something. Therefore, it's a herb. <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, it's amazing herb for um for depression. It's fantastic for anxiety. It can be quite calming with anxiety, but generally for depression, I would highly anxious patients. I would not recommend them to have medicinal mushrooms but really deeply depressed patients they can be very 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 useful and you know depending where you're at so microdosing is is a therapy in its own right and if we're not talking about microdosing and if we're talking about the um, yeah if we're talking about um eating them or mm. what is the benefit for us um what do mushrooms give us physically Okay, well, the main component in mushrooms is beta glucan, and beta glucan glucans is uh, they are so um, beneficial for our immune system. That's the, absolutely they they are they are medicine for our gut. Okay, and like our, our gut, you know, our intestines from mouth to anus and everything in between is like the second brain of the body, and beta glucans is 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 food for that. It's food for our good bacteria, so it really does get every get everything boosts our immune system from from our belly upwards, so belly outwards, should I say? So yeah, it's it's there it's essential component in life. You know, I make sure that my family is having mushrooms at least once a week. This time of year, more because they're abundant everywhere, you know, and, and, and there's so many mushrooms. I mean, you asked before, you've got oysters, you've got shiitake, you know, uh, reishi, reishi is amazing. G Ganoderma lucidum. I mean, I, I recommend that, have that in uh, powder form, I have that in tincture form. I recommend that to patients quite a lot, especially because it has a, a real alkalizing effect in the system. I mean, I have it in an immune enhancing powder that I make, definitely that's in there. Also patients um, undergoing cancer, we always recommend mushrooms for them. You know, medicinal mushrooms are, depends if you're a stage four cancer patient you've got in front of you, you know that mushrooms is where you need to go. You need to bring in the big boys and that's your, your medicinal mushrooms. They are unbelievable. But even for us, I mean, to be honest, all mushrooms are going to give you that immune enhancing. So, you know, your big portobello mushrooms are going to be doing the same as, as your reishi, just, you know, just in different quantities. It's, it's the same thing. You're still going to be, it's still going to be giving you beta glucans. It's still going to be increasing your immune system, no better or worse. There are, I mean, certain mushrooms will have uh, certain uh, effects that, that are not across the board. For example, lion's mane. Lion's mane is, is used a lot with uh, menopause because it's particularly good for foggy head, brain fog, and this type of stuff. So it can, it can add a clarity of, of, of mind, if you like, lion's mane. And it's funny to look at these, these things. That's where the doctrine of signatures comes in. You know, it, it's got like this shaggy hairdo thing going on about it. It looks like a mad professor. And so, yeah, I always think, you know, it looks like a few of my, my old uh, teachers, that's for sure, you know, so it's really, yeah, it, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a one, you know, mushrooms are just out of this world. You yeah. mentioned growing them, um, just so you mm. can really know what they look mm. like. So Absolutely. Look, and it's so funny because today I had exactly that same thought. I was out walking with, um, with my dog, Teddy, and... I was looking at mushrooms and I was thinking, I need to grow these so that I can get to know what they look like when they're small and at different stages, because that's how I learned what so many plants actually are is because I grow them. I recognize them as seedlings. I know that they're not, they're not weeds. Um, or I know that the difference between what I've grown and what's there, <laughs> that's wild, if I can put it that way. And, and that's how you build the relationship. So when you said that, I thought, ah, there you go. There's your confirmation. There's my confirmation. It comes through, yeah, it comes through others. Exactly. Absolutely. So, yes, you yeah, have a look for those. You were also talking about oak, and that was also on my list of things to ask you about, because I noticed that in your book. And is it true that acorns are poisonous? 
Well, acorns are full of tannins, okay? And tannins are have a drying astringent effect. So a bit like, they're really like, they pull all the, all, the, all, all the juice out of something, which is great if you've got diarrhea. You want a tannin, you know? So, you know, but if you're constipated, well, that's seriously gonna make this, the situation a hundred times worse, okay? So everything has its place, okay? Everything absolutely has its place. But acorns, I mean, in, in, my, in my book, um, I show people how they can make acorn flour. Because back in the day, you would be able to, you know, acorn was, there was this whole culture, yeah, not culture, this whole community in, um, in Greece that were known as the people who eat from the fruit of the oak. Okay, so it's, it's a really, you know, they, they, they would become strong. They were strong people, apparently, and it's because they ate acorns. All right. Now, when you taste an acorn, it's incredibly bitter. OK, so when you prepare it, you need to wash it. OK, like we, we did this thing where, where we did it two ways. One, we, we put a bag in a, in a running river. OK, so we literally just put a stone so the bag would be in the running river and we just let it to, for there for like three, four days. That's a really old school way to do it. That's really in touch with nature, 100 percent. And the more modern way to do it, and it sounds gross, but it's really not, is that we put a bag in the cistern of the toilet. OK, which is that's obviously not where you know it's the clean water that comes to that. So every time we press the flush, the water would flush and up and that would be a way of rinsing it. OK, and I think I've written in, in, in the book like how. A nice simple way to do it. I see what I wrote in here. Yeah, yeah. So yes, exactly. So I, I, I've got yeah. Keep washing until the water runs clear, and you do do that. And I, I do mention about that. So and then afterwards, it takes days. It does. And then afterwards, you roast them in the oven, and you can grind them. But you want them to stop. Uh, yeah. Do you want to get rid of the bitterness? But it is really. It's not that they're poisonous. It's just the astringent. But they are original. Um. Yeah. Original. Again, a meat of the forest. Um. But. Yeah, incredibly. Like before we, we, you know, in this cult country, in Britain, we didn't have loads of almond trees. You know, we still don't, actually. <laughs> we still don't, but we're having almond milk, almond everything. We actually have like acorns, you know, so we, we don't use these acorns, but th there's a lot to be had from them. And the acorn, I mean, the, the oak, should I say, is it has a long history with the Druids. In fact, even the name uh, uh, the, the the Scottish name for druid is druid or something, and that relate that means uh, the one that is the keeper of the oak knowledge. The, the 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 yeah the keeper of the oak knowledge. I think that's the way it is. Yes, but so it just shows. But oak oak is definitely um, a herb of uh, uh, wise ones. If you like, you can you can have oak leaf tea. That's going to be slightly astringent, but not in any way like a, like a acorn. So it's yeah, try oak leaf and and get a, a a connection with it because we know the flower essence is very good for strength. It's very good for courage. It's for those people who um, uh, who work themselves past burnout, which is probably explains why I have a dear psychic friend and uh, I've I've seen her for like I don't know, I think twenty years. We've known each other now, and every time I speak to her, she goes. Caroline, your oak man is there. And I'm like, really? She goes, you're the only person I've ever met that has an oak man in spirit behind them. I'm like, really? And I have this real draw towards oak trees. But I also have historically, um, you know, worked myself beyond to burnout. So it, totally there would be like, you know, the on a spiritual level I'm being provided. <laughs> it's, I just love the way these things work. But uh, yeah, just be, be just the preparation is with acorn. That's, that's the thing. It's not poisonous, but the preparation is with the acorn. I thought that there must be something there because they're so abundant. Mm. They're of our landscape, of our climate. And, and I did know about the Druid connection, right. the oak groves being sacred. Yeah. And so I, when I saw oak in your book, I thought, oh, yeah. tell me more. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so um, so that, that's very, very interesting. Um, Yes, indeed. Oh, yeah, so, I've got the recipe for an acorn cake in my book, by the way. Oh, mm. fabulous. Oh, well, you have to let me know how you get on with that. But it's but things like, um, like I said, it's good for diarrhea, but also, you know, hemorrhoids, all things that need kind of drying up, pussy, pussy stuff, you know, it's useful. You can use it externally as well as internally. You know, it's just it's just knowing what to do with these things, you know, like mushrooms. People are taught to avoid them. We're taught to avoid these things because we don't understand. So it's merely we're taught by ignorance to avoid them, whereas actually with knowledge and then the application of that knowledge, you have the wisdom about that. So 
it is just learning. So you with you mentioned the oak leaf tea. So are the leaves yep. still green? Because obviously they're turning at this point. So it's, it's, are, yeah. do we do them? Are they okay to have now, or do we have spring. only summer? Well, um, to be honest, I mean, I had some oak leaf tea just what, two, three days ago. I was in Wales, and yeah, I had made some oak leaf tea, and I thought, yeah, it's not the right time of year by you know leaf is spring, and you know this time of year is 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 the berries and the fruit. But I thought, you know what, it was it's the same effect. It's it's the same effect. You know, I was like, okay, this leaf that I I got, they were lovely green leaves that I got. I mean, it's it's more hardened. It's like if you pick nettle at a different time of year. You know, it it's got different more nutrients slightly more irritable at a different time of year but it's still going to give you the iron that you need as in nettle and equally this is still going to be an astringent it's just it has the life force of the plant is going to the nut now but there's still life in the leaf of course i see yes of course. okay well that that's um that's brilliant now i have a, a question that may or may not be autumn related well it's not okay. autumn related as in these are not what you would think of as autumn plants. So it's fever few, abundant in summer, but it's still, you know, it's still going strong on my allotment. Um, and, but the, the question I have is this, because is it I, I read somewhere that um, it's good for migraine. And I had a recipe for putting fever few in butter. The thing is, it's incredibly bitter. And I did not enjoy the experience. Absolutely. So <laughs> is this correct that feverfew yeah. is good for, for headaches and for migraine yeah. particularly? And is there any other way in which I might be able to use it? Yeah, that's true. Yes, it is the bitter herbs. Um, uh, yes, uh, feverfew is incredibly good for migraine and headaches. Okay, and, and yeah, different levels of it can be consistent use, though. It, it will will affect it. So, for example, when I give people tanacetum, uh, parthenium, I, I uh, depends whether they're chronic or they're acute. So have they, you know, they just get a, a one off headache or, or, you know, occasionally they get a headache related to their cycle, for example, or they, they have it all the time. And it just it, there's this, this always this hum in the background, depending on type of headache it is. Um, so that so that depends on dose. Um, I like to do tinctures because it's bitter. Um, you can do teas as well. So that's one way. Um, but the thing is to know about the bitter taste, because actually the bitter taste in its own right can be incredibly beneficial because in the West, we, we avoid the taste of bitter because if you look at the, the five tastes, OK, they are pungent, salty, sweet, sour and bitter. OK, so look at most of our food is sweet and salty. OK, and occasionally pungent if you have a curry in there as well. Right. But mostly it's sweet and salty. And that's the way we live. So our body is missing these other flavors specifically. Or we might have all four except for the bitter. So bitter is missed and bitter is needed for the heart. It's needed for circulation. It's needed for the liver. You know, the taste of bitter when we have it is a little bit the way that sour affects you. But it's more like it makes you go, oh, which means what it does in the body is it squeezes that gallbladder and that liver so it can release toxins. Well, you know what? We need that to happen. You know, we actually need that effect in the body. So if we're just having more like salty and sweet, we're putting more pressure on the kidneys. And, you know, the, the sweet is like just causing fermentation in the bowels. So we're actually we need that. taste. So, so don't shy away from the taste of bitter in if you can handle it, go for it because it's very beneficial for you. So we need to have it. But yeah, for, for if you're going to have to take things several times a day, it can be easier to, to, to make a tincture. I, I like the idea of the tincture, actually. It hadn't occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, I like that idea very much. Um, I might just have a go at that because it's, I've yeah. still got quite a lot on the allotment. Great. Um, something in your book that surprised me was corn. But of mm. course, it is a good time for sweet corn, isn't it? It is. Yes. Yep. Tell yeah. About corn. Okay, corn. Well, yes, corn is, uh, corn is definitely... Um, one that's revered by the ancients, okay, and def definitely the Native American Indians. It's again, it goes with the pumpkin. It, it, it is one of the sacred plants. I mean, they would always, and I, I, I've done this in a, a Wardolf Steiner kindergarten, like parent child group, where we make a, and I've done it since, is that where we make a little corn dolly around 
the autumn harvest around the equinox and you know it's like our blessing and it will live on our autumn altar for example and this is like our blessing for the the thanks to the crop that's just come and blessing for the 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 crops to come for next year and that's what they used to do is they would make like a corn dolly and they would use the husks of the corn and the corn silk which is where my my uh, my use as medicine comes from and they would leave that that made corn dolly and leave it in the field because they felt that the the field was barren left without um, the corn that when it was cut down, they felt for the field and said, oh, no, the field is without corn. And if you've ever walked past or walked through a cornfield, it feels like it has a presence. It re I mean, I know that you can hide in a cornfield easily and there's been a lot of lot of films about this, I'm sure. But it really has this presence. I remember walking with my son earlier this year and there were like eight cornfields around us. And I was like walking through and he goes, you know, I feel like people are watching me, mum. I said, yeah, that's the corn. It feels corn does have a have a real presence to it. So by 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 uh, leaving that corn dolly, you're you're not leaving the field alone, which is just so beautiful. I mean, the the ancients really had this affiliation with nature. They really just like they cared about it, and they felt that oh, I don't want it to feel. It's just beautiful. But anyway, for me, my medicine when it comes to the corn, yes, there's lots in uh, corn. You know, there's again lots of vitamin C. It's a it's a, it's a it's a great food to have. It's it's one that we're now overproducing actually but it, it, it has its benefits to some degree if it's not GMO etc but for me for the medicine is actually the corn silks which is uh, when you open up the corn you take off the husk it's these thready bits on it so if you dry those they go a little bit brown they are incredibly good for urinary tract infections cystitis they're really good for kidney cleansing amazing and this is just like a throwaway flith as we call it just a throwaway a throwaway thing that we we do but it's it's so beneficial. So yeah, that that is really it has a lot of medicine and it, and it's not recognised very often. We just think, we think of corn as the corn on the cob, and then you barbecue it, and hey, the kids love it, and then off you go. You know, it's great food for 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 people. It sustains people because it's an easy food to grow. Although it's only easy really if you spray it. It's you know unless if you're in a warmer country, it's easier. But uh, yeah, so it's it's easy to grow and it's also um yeah easy easy food for people. It fills them up but it's not necessarily, uh, yeah. What they have to do to corn these days, I mean, 90% of it is genetically modified, which is so disturbing. So they have to spray it with glycophytes. They have to spray it because that's the thing with GM. It's like one plus one equals two. They have to use the chemicals on it to ensure they grow again. And then they start again all over again. But yeah, it's quite disturbing. In these eight fields I walked through with my son, there was these empty jerrycans of glycophate. I'm like, oh my God. And I learned today in a garden centre, they said that they have to spray in order to turn the corns brown, you know, so basically like, like to, to get them ready. So I'm like, what? It's like, where's nature playing this part? I mean, I know I've grown them in my garden. You don't need to do that. No, you That's don't. Because, don't. because there's a demand for so much of it. You know, there's so yeah. a demand for you, so much. You most definitely, it is not necessary. And I only learned... Um, actually this very week that oh. the 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 genetic modification that is involved in our vegetation is not to make them more resistant to pests it is to make them resistant to the herbicides and the pesticides so that they can survive the onslaught of chemicals that are there to basically destroy everything else and i I was quite shocked about that because although I've always been very suspicious, particularly because it has been a means by which um, big pharma companies have actually um, patented seeds so that you can no longer collect seed legally or share it. Um, so the, these innovations that were meant to be helping poor farmers are actually making it possible for them. Yeah. Um, so not only would that I, I always was suspicious for that reason, and now I learned yet something else which shocked me because I thought that I naively thought that the reason for genetic modification was to help the plants yeah, feed the survive, as well. to survive the onslaught of insects, you know, and it turns out that it doesn't even have that benefit. So I was quite horrified to, to learn that. and. Um, Anyway, we are indeed digressing, but it is true Important that point. if you yeah. have a garden and you want to grow sweet corn, it is a very 
easy plant to grow. I've grown it. Yep. Caroline, you just need a quantity, don't you? You need a certain, because they, they pollinate each other. So you can't just grow right. one. You have to grow at least two. So but you, yeah, that's no. right. But actually I had, um, I had um, uh, a self -fer you can get self-fertile variety with, so that you don't need that if that complication. And if you don't have a lot of, um, a lot of space, again, and you, it's it's cheaper to buy one packet of seeds. You don't have if, if it's self fertile. You can you can do that. Um, so have a look for that um, because that that's one one innovation that we have created through selective breeding, which is quite helpful. <laughs> so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so we've so got to take the best and leave the rest. You know what I mean? It's not all bad out there, but but it's there is something bad, to, no. we need if, to be conscious if, of. Yeah. If you don't have a you know, a, a huge field on which to grow corn and different varieties and seed is, it's, it's, you know, if you're buying a lot of seed, it's quite pricey unless you are able to uh, swap seed with, um, with friends, etc. So if you're just getting started, one packet of seeds is fabulous. And, and so these, these are things that are indeed helpful. So now back to medicine um, and I, I'm just fascinated that you're using the silky part of it um, for cystitis. That is extraordinary. Yeah. I, I'm so excited every time I speak to you and I learn something else. It's actually uh, even an antidepressant. Anti, it's, for anti, for, it's, it's an antidepressant as well. So you can use it for depression. It's like amazing how these things have an effect on every level. So Somebody, what are you with these silky threads? Are you, oh, you making them into a tea? You dry them and make a tea. Simple. Wow. It's so simple. If I can't wait for corn season. In fact, I'd love to grow a field of corn, but then you'd have all the different varieties. Like I'd love the American yes. varieties, you know, the, the, the native ones where they all are, oh, they're beautiful, black and red and white and yes. amazing. But then just just because I want to collect, I don't necessarily want the corn or my kids would be happy, but, you know, to have the corn silk, you need quite a lot, you know, but that's lovely. So, yeah, it's great. Wow. You would have to have a, a huge barbecue, I think, then. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the other thing, of course, that, I associate with this time of year is chestnuts. Sweet chestnuts are my favorite. I adore them. It takes me back to my childhood in Portugal and being collected by my grandmother outside school. There would be um, a man with a little um, bar wheelbarrow type thing on which there was a, a small barbecue on which he was roasting chestnuts. Um, and so that always takes me back. And I adore door chestnuts so medicinal uses for chestnuts tell me because they are abundant and you can forage for them you can yes i, I did with the kids recently and uh yeah i mean they're not so big in this country but i did also i found some uh also in a shop recently where there were massive ones from france i was like because they're 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 mostly from yeah Europe from the rest of Europe you know we do have some in this country but i uh, fantastic um really good for mouth ulcers OK, they're great for mouth ulcers, which is great. So you would use them as a gargle and uh, yeah, kind of this. This is where they're particularly useful for. But they are also um, they are, again, uh, like corn, they're sustainable food for whole cultures. So again, if, I mean, I said about the oak, but there's the same similar story with the sweet with the sweet chestnut that you can feed a whole you know, a whole village on just them because they are so sustainable, but they're incredibly nutritious. I mean, I learned recently and I put this in the book that they're, they're again, particularly good for brain fog. I was like, wow, I just need loads of that. You know, so all my perimenopausal and menopausal ladies right, eat chestnuts. I was like, I was saying to my mother-in-law, when's it, because she's French, so when's the chestnut season? It's now, isn't it? I really would love to be in France doing, you know, right now, which of course they're, they're picking them all. But yeah, so you do some as a gargle. I mean, what else you can do? It is digestively um i was looking as well what i've also put a moment oh, yeah there you go that's what i wanted to know as well to be reminded of is uh particularly good for um all sorts of uh it's an antibacterial so it's good for gram positive bacteria so it's good for whooping cough specifically which is great to know and you can just make a tea again you can make like what they call it uh creme de marron which is like you know like a like a little paste from it you know, and um, uh, again, roasted is great. You just have them roasted. But yeah, it's got really healing properties for the gut. It's, it's, re it's really good. I don't, I don't know yet. I mean, hopefully uh, we'll see, but I don't know any allergies caused by it. It's really, it's really like one of the safe foods, you know, to have that doesn't cause any allergies. 
I, I do love um, chestnuts, as, as I've already said, and chestnut puree is absolutely brilliant because you can do all sorts of things. Uh, one thing I did do only last week, um, I wanted to use it as an icing for a, a cake. Mm. And what I did was I just used chestnut puree and sweetened it with honey. And, mm. and then I added a little bit of yogurt to mm. make it more more smooth or easier to spread on the cake oh, and it was the first time I did it um did I add cocoa to it I may have added a hint of cocoa to it I don't think I did um I think I just added honey and yogurt to it and it it really was a really good experiment <laughs> wow oh yeah I need the recipe that sounds amazing it is so delicious I bet I bet it was but I've never I've never used the puree that way. I've used the, the flour and to make cake with flour which is oh delicious but to make the puree oh I can just imagine like a chestnut cake with the puree as the icing in the middle oh mm, you, can, you can just buy the puree in the same yes. the, the same there's a, a very helpful French company that exports to <laughs> to hear that um where you can that you can buy chestnuts from and that you can also um have the paste and as you say when i've collected i have yet to perfect roasting chestnuts i came so close this year but wow. i think that the issue is that they are smaller than the ones that oh, we wow. do on the continent and so consequently i think i had them for i roasted them for too long yeah, um, so I'm going to get black try. chestnuts. <laughs> so there is a trick. There is a trick. Okay, that apparently you you put a cross or you cut into each of them, but you leave one that's not cut, and you throw that in the mix. And when that one pops, they should be ready. Oh, that's try that. That's that's an old old tale, old wives' tale. See if that one works. That one works. I, I'm definitely going to try that because what I came across was was also brilliant. Where you you know you do have to. You know, as you say, make the cross on them, um, and and here I soaked them for two hours, mm -hmm. so that they were. So I soaked them in water for a couple of right. hours, and then when I put them into the oven, I also put put under it a um, a bowl of a Pyrex dish of um, of water, okay. so that there was steam and there was moisture to stop them drying out, mm -hmm. and I. So I could feel I was so close to getting it right. I yeah. think it was just that because they're smaller, they needed less time. I think so. And um, and I thought, I nearly next time I'm doing this, you're gonna get it. We've got I, a little bit of this season left, so don't worry. Keep 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 at it. You'll I'll keep it. doing it, and um, and now I'll know to leave one, uh, leave not. One wait for so it to that, pop and it's great because in the fire you can't always because i always roast mine in fire and you can't always tell when that if they've got wood in there you can't tell which is where's the popping coming from but in the in the oven you will know for sure you're like okay that's <laughs> that's definitely coming from my oven <laughs> oh that's marvelous so whilst we're talking about chestnuts of course we yeah. can't not talk about conkers so mm. tell us about well, yes, not to be confused, you know, these two really need to be differentiated. One has got the short, lots of little spikes and one's like kind of more harder spikes on a, on a conker, isn't it? Don't eat the conker is all I can say, you know, don't eat them. Although we do use them. I have, I have here, um, where's it called? I always called it uh, Asculus hippocaster, hippocassinum. Now I do use that in medicine. I will uh, use that to make um, a hemorrhoid ointment. Really good. It's a, it's like it's like the oak. It's quite similar. These nuts have similar components because it's really you know it's astringent. It will really help to pucker up as what is what you want. You know, like a, an, on a on a uh, on a hemorrhoid, definitely. Um, so it's really good for that. So yeah, and also for people with varicose veins, with we can do a tincture on that and, and helps with tinctures. But generally, I mean, with horse chestnut, I get people, and I've got a, a recipe for a horse chestnut salve here, and you can put that on your varicose veins. So you can make your own um, salve to, to help your own varicose veins, like be them thread veins or varicose veins. But it's, yeah, it's really, really very good. I've, I, I've even used it with patients with thrombosis, although do go to see the doctor as well but you know on that one but yeah certainly you can use it you know there's there's lots of uh, lots of uses for it but yeah as a as a rule don't eat it um you know that's definitely the one with that that is that's interesting because i i put that one in to differentiate and it's like well, what if i put one in that you can't actually eat but uh it's 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 necessary i mean you you can to be honest you can but you would need 
like someone like me on over your shoulder to make sure you know that you know I'm not um this is the point of like you know herbalists are well trained in this you know so we really you know we we know when you can and when you can't use it and yes we will make medicine out of it out of the seeds you know out of the shell of the seed we'll make that medicine but uh we rather you wouldn't <laughs> in that front but in here i have given you the recipe for um like i said how to make your own venus salve and how to make your own laundry soap which is amazing because it is historically known as soap nut okay and it has this frothy component to you and it's so brilliant so you just like you you open up your chestnuts you know and you stick them in some water and and that's the way that i do it and uh yeah i mean i still actually have some left over from last year so it's amazing and even if you don't use them all like you you can just save some in a jar your cut chestnuts and then you can uh, have them ready for next year and just add the water when you when you want to use your wash it's amazing it's so simple out there you know that and this is yes, it's not conquered this is conkers oh this is conkers sorry this not is horse chestnuts not sweet chestnuts yeah, so right. sweet chestnuts eat the sweet chestnuts. They're delicious and nutritious, and you can sustain a whole village on them. But for the conkers, after you've played your conker game, don't even waste that conker from the conker game. Put that, chop that conker up, put it in water, and you can feed your washing machine. So, I, or, or your hand wash. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Well, we are already, um, I guess I would say, halfway through autumn. And so winter is approaching. Is there anything that we could be doing right now to prepare for winter? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, well, absolutely. I mean, this, yes, get your chestnuts in, definitely, because that's nutritious food. Get your pumpkins in, again, nutritious food, because it's almost, you know, we've still got harvest. There's still things to harvest. Apples, I mean, I live in Somerset. There is like apples in abundance. It's unbelievable, you know, I was at my, uncle's house just day before yesterday and he's like do you want some apples and my gran had planted like 20 trees in the orchard and it's so nice to know that you know I'm picking apples from my grand's orchard. and there's so many different varieties I'm like of course you know I'm going to use them because I'm going to make apple rings for the kids we're going to have apple puree we can use it for everything we're going to freeze apple chunks for all these lovely you know pies to keep us through the winter there's so many apple juice and cider we're trying it all this year so you know you can do lots of things so that is still there's 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 things to do there rose hips are still out so certainly we can make a lot with rose hips rose hips will keep us going throughout the winter i mean that's the joy about rose hips it's funny because I, I i nearly left um rose hips out of the autumn book but i was like no no, they're in season because they've got such a long season you know they can keep going right right throughout january and february they're, they're amazing because they need the frost to be ready i mean you get squishy ones on the tree now but they need the frost and, and of course you know the uk is not as cold as it used to be certainly this time of year it's like the frost seems to happen after Christmas rather than it used to happen way we've had a little bit, but hardly anything worth talking about, you know. Um, so it's a lot warmer this year. So, uh, yes, I would say that rose hip, you can be making your rose hip. Uh, you, you could be drying some so you can have it for tea. You can be making the fresh syrup. You know, I tried to make the syrup with dried. It's never quite the same. I make it with fresh and and a, and a, and a cheeky little way to trick your rose hips into thinking that we've had a frost is to shove them in the uh, freezer and then you can make your syrups with them so it, it's kind of like a chemical chemical thing that happens with them so yeah so definitely start preparing your rose hips. I mean it's the time of year when we put you know we put the garden to bed you know you prepare it's like you know I always say that this is uh this is the time of year when you know nature starts to have a death okay but equally, in, in the old, uh, the pagan Druid traditions, you know, this is not only the, the time of death, it's also the time of life. Because if we think about, you know, the leaves, they're falling from the trees and, and the seeds are falling. But as, as the seeds are falling, they're, you know, creatures are running off with them and eating them. And the seeds are getting planted deep in the sea. All those, all those acorns that are falling on the ground, you know, they've all got little shoots because they're trying to find their way to, to become new oak trees, you know, and, and, the, and the land is being covered in, in leaves, which is going to become mulch and feed the soil. So it's death and life all at the same time. So we always think, oh, it's just the darkness of things, but it's just, what we call the tween time it's a time between it's the end of summer definitely for sure and autumn is like the time between or between winter and, and and summer so it's more of a starting to slow down starting to prepare make sure that your pantry has got you've got your stocked up you've got what you need you know you've dried your herbs this summer you've got your your syrups and your fruits and your nice vegetables and 
just basically making sure you stocked up, you've got enough firewood in and your chestnuts there, you are roasting them on the fire. So it really is a time to slow, to go in, to nourish. And, and it's interesting because I, I look at the herbs that are around this time of year and they are very nourishing. Like pumpkin is incredibly nutritious as are chestnuts, sweet chestnuts, very nutritious. You know, it's, it's all this, in, and obviously, you know, you know, nature wants us to be inside washing our, our clothes because it's providing us with laundry soap. But, you know, there's, it's just it, it's it's yes, yeah, this real nutrition. We need to build our immune system this time of year. So we start to eat soups and stews and really nourishing, warming foods that, again, you know, they, 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 they help to, to build us, um, you know, build our immunity. So that's why your rosehip syrup, your elderberry, elderberries, they're all and blackberries it's all this this time of autumn leads us up to vitamin c and, and to making sure that we're we're healthy as we go into winter yeah, as nature takes a little death and and they hibernate and go to sleep so yeah if people are thinking about uh planting um rose roses for rose hips mm -hmm. is the variety that is especially known for providing excellent rose hips for this purpose true absolutely a good question absolutely because there are so many variety of roses out there but rose uh, rosa canina it is otherwise known as canina canine dog rose is um is the original it's the original original rose and it's this beautiful like uh whitey pinky just like maybe it hasn't got many petals and it's just this little little specks in in the hedgerows and mostly it goes it's not the prettiest bush you know it's quite straggly it's a bit like a blackberry but you know a bit more contained than a bramble you know it, it's it's got this kind of look about it so it's not your classic um garden it's a simple rose it's, it's very it's simple not, the it's not the multi-layered rose that we're exactly. used to but it's the wild rose the wild and rose. and yes and it's funny because back in june i was paying attention to where there were wild roses so that I could go back at this time of Good. year. Well, that's the, the key is observing nature and you're absolutely, you're absolutely spot on, spot on. And then now you can see for next year, as you start to see where it has, so you'll see that now the birds will be eating the rose hips. Okay. So then start to look under trees for next year, because then the poop, that's where you're starting the seeds and we'll start to get the new rose hips around. So yeah, start to see this emergence of it. But yeah, I mean, the rose hips are so abundant this year. It's like nature's really saying, hey, 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 you know what? I've got it covered. It really is. It feels like it is, you know, it's like, okay, I'm trusting in you. No. It's so true that what we remember is what draws our attention. I am pretty lousy at remembering my way to things unless there are trees that I will <laughs> remember, etc. But I can tell you where, you know, those beautiful mushrooms that you're not supposed to eat, the red ones with the yes. white spots. I can yes. exactly where to find them. Um, just because they stand out and they're so beautiful. And I look forward to seeing them every year. Yes. So where we walk, um, one of the places where we walk, just a few weeks ago, I said, oh, they're not here this year. I thought they'd be here. Yesterday, there they were. <laughs> they come up overnight, those ones. They are, um, they are literally the, the magical. There's a lot of mythology around those. Really they're, are, you know, they're, they're, but they're the classic ones that you see in the fairy tales. And so- first time I ever saw one was about two years ago and I got so excited and I thought oh uh, fairy tales um and so then I started to notice where they were and and remembering and and that's the I guess what I'm saying is if we're paying attention we notice we remember we may have missed it this season but there's always next year and right. next year we'll know where to go because particularly you know when we're just learning yeah. and it's and, and just getting used to adjusting our eyes to these things it's exactly. you're we're going to miss them but we won't next year no exactly you're absolutely right that you know to it is the first point of learning herbal medicine is absolutely to observe you have to observe, observe the plants. Like, you know, you say you're growing your herbs. It's like, that's how I learned from the ground. It's like, you know, you start to observe what is it like as a seed? How does it act? And then how is it when I ingest it or I give it to a patient? It's like, it is, you know, where, where are things and how do things work in, 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 in synchronicity in nature? Everything works together. It's amazing. You can see that, okay, and a classic one is, you know, mistletoe. It's like the mistle thrush. 
is the one that carries the seed, like eats that and carries the seed. And you'll see off they go and it's in the middle of an oak tree or, or wherever, you know, it's just, yeah, nature. And then you can see, okay, that's where the mistle thrush, or you can see the thrushes murmuring and say, oh, wow, that will be mistletoe there this year. So you start to observe and take in, absolutely. It, it's, it's, it, it's the way that we learn. And that intimate relationship with nature is, is there because I, I believe with mistletoe, it actually has to go through the bird. 100%. Order to be able to, and it's because it's crushed. Same with rosehip. Same with rosehip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing because they have like their 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 gullets. They they have ability to be able to break open the the stone. It's just unbelievable. We could, you know, it's not going to have the same effect with us. You know, <laughs> it's like we don't have that apparatus. It's like it's no, amazing. we don't. Um, pestle and waters, maybe, but not. <laughs> <laughs> oh well, Caroline. Um, what another fabulous conversation! Thank you so very much for your time today. Always and, lovely to talk to you. And how can people find you? Great. Well, um, I am. I have a business called Heaven on Earth Herbals. That is my website, uh, heavenonearthherbals.com. Um, I, of course, the books can be available on Amazon and through my website, Discover, Discovering the Herbs of Autumn, Spring and Summer. So Discovering the Herbs of the Seasons. Um, and yeah, there's various things. I mean, what I offer is a consultation where people can work with me on a one-on-one -on -one, um, where this is where I am their guide and they really do get that that's a full relationship going on and, and we really do guide them through the changes and back to health. Um, also, people can do nowadays courses. I've got quite a few courses coming up. I did one earlier this year on the immune system, which I will do at the beginning of the year because it's timely. So, yeah, and, and they can find all the information out on my website. So, yeah, please do have a look. Wonderful, wonderful. And I will be putting a link to that on the description box to, to the, this interview. So thank you all for watching. Until next time. Goodbye. Bye bye.